Okay, I'm going to say good evening to everyone joining us from Asia, or good morning if you're from the US, or good afternoon from the UK and Europe. We've got a lot of people who have registered for this webinar, so we are going to just let people drop in over the next few minutes. It can take a little while for people to come in. We've got only 90 people registered, actually. So for those that uh, are able to make it, this is actually being streamed on YouTube and Facebook, and the recording will be there as well. So for those who can't make it today, who are watching this recording, don't worry when it comes to questions you're going to get the opportunity to listen to every single question that we uh, is asked today of the esteemed uh, delegates that we've got. So uh, while people are joining in, I'm just going to do some introductions, if that's OK. I'm going to start off with Professor Eitan Brisman, who uh, we've worked very closely with at the Charles First Faculty. Professor Brisman actually studied at Charles First Faculty a number of years ago. I won't tell exactly how many years ago because that's not polite. Uh, and then actually now he's worked as a doctor in the UK. You'll notice from his accent that he's actually British, but then went back to Prague a number of years ago and is now the Vice Dean of International uh, Student Affairs there. Then uh, ably aided by Susanna, Susanna from the International Office there, who does a lot of the promotion work for the programme. Uh, they've just come off the back of a very busy open day weekend, straight and had an exam on Friday, and I've got interviews coming up this week, so no doubt everyone is... Uh, kind of like feeling the effects of that, but no more feeling the effects as Dr. Aaron Chuk, who actually I met now, I think coming up to seven years ago when he sat the entrance exam with Medical Doorway. Uh, Dr. Chuk has graduated last year. I was actually at Aaron's graduation. So if you do look at our video from there as well, you'll see him there. And Aaron has just recently been successful in getting a very competitive residency in anesthesiology over in Boston, Massachusetts. And Aaron will talk more about that when we get onto that part of the presentation. So like I said, we've got more people joining us all the time. The numbers are ticking up all uh, consistently. So what we'll do is uh, I think we've got a presentation from the team at Charles University. For those that have got questions who are kind of signing now, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom. If you, when you've got a question, just type it into the Q&A feature, all right? Then what we'll do is at the end of the presentation, we will kind of verbalize all those questions because not everyone on this call can see the questions. So we'll verbalize them. And that means that you who have signed in to listen to the presentation, as well as people listening to the recording, will actually be able to ask, uh, hear those questions. And then we'll answer those questions depending on who's the most appropriate person to answer them. I've actually got a few questions myself to ask Aaron because it's a while since we've caught up. Uh, so, but, but be my guest and to ask any question you want. The one thing we're not going to do is we're not going to read your name out with the question. So don't worry, any question that you've got, simply ask it. You're going to be anonymous. No one's going to kind of uh, kind of ridicule you for your question. There's no such thing as stupid questions. I think we can all agree on that because if you've got a question, then uh, no doubt other people have the exact same question as well. Okay, more people are coming in and I'm recognizing a lot of the names. That's really good because I've spoken to many of you before. And I can even see we've got some uh, college counselors from our time in Hong Kong as well that are joining us. Okay, so what I need to do is just change the screen sharing on. Okay, there we go. So now everyone will be able, who's online, will be able to share the screen. Okay, so I think uh, Susanna or Professor Brisman, I'm going to hand over to you and mute myself now because I think people have already got a bit fed up of my voice over the next few minutes. And then, as I said, anyone got any questions, just tap it into the Q&A and we'll deal with those at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Wonderful. Um, it's a good evening, I suppose, for our guests coming from Hong Kong. Uh, I remember very fondly uh, my time there with you not long ago, um, and I can't wait to come back. So we thought we would tell you a little bit about us, uh, what we offer. Um, first Faculty of Medicine, Charles University. Let's first start with who we are and where we are. So Charles University is based in Prague, which is in the capital, or which is the capital of Czech Republic, which is the very heart of Europe, the very center of Europe. Uh, as you can see from the map, we are the, the largest border is with Germany, We're surrounded on, on the west side and north side by Germany, Austria below us, and then Poland and Slovakia 
on the east and northeast uh, borders. Um, it's a country with a moderate climate. Right today, we seem to be having all the climates. We've had snow, we've got sun, we've got uh, everything going on today. Um, but it's also it's an, it's an atheist uh, country by religion, uh, and it is Bohemia of old. Bohemia known for being uh, a country of understanding, of empathy, uh, and freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of, of uh, uh, lifestyle. Um, Prague itself is currently ranked the third safest city in, in the world. Um, and it was recently ranked by Time magazine as being the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, the public transport is second to none, whether it's snowing, raining, wind or sun, uh, 24 hours a day, there is underground, the metro, the uh, trams, the trains, the buses, all working and seemingly always on time. Um, it's right in the heart of Europe. So as you saw from that map before, it's about three hours to Berlin. It's about two and a half, three hours to Vienna. It's it's connected everywhere. And because it's the heart of, of the EU as well, so theoretically, uh, as fact, Ben often likes to, to, to tell us, you could walk from here to the Atlantic Ocean without having to show your passport or, or anything else. Um, I personally probably prefer flying or going by train, but uh, <laughs> theoretically you could you could walk all the way through. So Charles University as a whole, we date back to 1348 when Charles University was created. Uh, in its original creation, there were four faculties of which we were one of them. So this medical faculty is the 10th oldest medical school in the world in history. And we maintain our ranking in the top 1% of medical schools and the university in the top 2% of all universities in the globe. Since 675 years ago, we've grown a bit. Now we have 17 faculties, five of which are medical. Three are here based in Prague and one in a beautiful city called Hradec Kralove to the northeast and one to the west in Pilsen. Uh, there are five medical faculties. Although we are by name uh, Faculty of Medicine, in this country, medicine implies both medicine and dentistry. So we have our School of Medicine and we have our School of Dentistry all coming under the Faculty of Medicine umbrella. The university now has about 50,000 students uh, in total Charles University, of which about one fifth, 10,000 students are international students coming from all over the globe. Uh, more than 130 different countries are represented in our undergraduate and postgraduate bodies. Our faculty itself is the largest medical faculty in Central Europe. We have 4,500 undergraduate students, of which about 3,500 or 3,800 are, uh, are Czech students, and about 800 are our international students studying medicine or dentistry in English uh, at their course here. But we have a very large uh, teaching faculty as well. So though we have large numbers of students, to match that, we have large numbers of teachers, professors. So in fact, the ratio is about one to three. So about one professor for every three students. So though we may be large in numbers, um, the group sizes are not large. And it's capacities of scale so that we can still maintain uh, small group sizes and more intimate student-doctor-patient uh, student interactions. Um, so the ranking, I think, is the next thing I'll talk to you about. We are, we are ranked the top 1% of all schools, medical schools globally. Um, there are different ranking systems about the QS ranking, the Times ranking, all give about the same. Interestingly, in US News recently, they ranked us as 17th best clinical medicine in the world. The US is a, a very key uh, nation to talk about because the world looks at the US and we see that as a, as a kind of a leveling system. And one of the ways of it being leveling is the US MLE, United States Medical Licensing Exam, the exam which every American medical student studying in America or any student who's studying a recognized course outside America must take to be able to work in America. So the numbers from us are very interesting. Um, we have recognition throughout the globe. And it's important to understand that our course is not only recognized here in Prague. Uh, and I say it's not only recognized here in Prague and Czech Republic, because there are courses that you can study medicine in the country where the own country does not recognize that degree. 
So it's very important, you know, yes, absolutely, you graduate from here, you are able to work in Czech Republic immediately upon graduation, providing you have the language skills, which we will teach you. We are recognized throughout the whole of the EU. We are recognized in Britain, even after Brexit, uh, so that our doctors and dentists have automatic full registration with a GMC upon graduation. So they don't need to do the F1 year, they come straight in uh, at F2. And in fact, we have many UK uh, hospitals that will actively recruit our students before they graduate. And all of our dental graduates are fought over by the uh, dental conglomerates, the dental uh, uh, practices throughout the UK. So that every single one has job offers, not one, but many offers before they've even graduated. Let's return to the US. We are accredited in all 50 states of the US. We are one of only 20 medical schools outside of America to have Californian state accreditation. Uh, we get this because of our continued excellence in our results. Looking at the US Emily, in 2020, our students that took the exam, 100% of our students that took step one passed first time. 100% of our students that took step two passed first time. And all of our students that apply for residency got matching. Last year, I'll admit we dropped a little bit. It was 97.6%, I think, that passed first time. Uh, but when we compare that to Harvard, who had 93%, we're still beating the Americans at their own game. So because of that, anyone with an American passport, with American citizenship, gets access to the full federal loan scheme. And we were also part of the GI Bill. So anyone who is a military veteran or from a military veteran family, they get not just the loan, but they also get the grant from the US government to study here. Similar grants offered by other countries. Uh, Israel offers its students 100% tuition fees to study with us. Germany offers a number of the German students 100% tuition fees uh, scholarship for all six years of study to study with us. Um, and this is because we have such amazing people like Dr. Chuk that's here with us today, um, who you know, was offered upon graduation uh, full postdoc scholarship to Harvard um, at graduation. In fact, I believe he's just got residency uh, in anesthesiology in Boston uh, starting now as well. So we're very, very proud of our, of our graduates like Dr. Chuk uh, and his colleagues, several others that went also to Harvard and to, to Boston and to Yale and to so on and so forth. Um, research. Research is an integral part of who we are. And it's important for the progress of medicine. So we actively encourage you to do research from your undergraduate studies. Year one, maybe not so much because you've got to adapt to the lifestyle of studying at university and studying abroad, being away from home. Uh, but from the second year, a lot of the students are getting involved and many of the students will publish as even first authors in high impact journals as an undergraduate. We have annual research conferences, uh, other events to promote your research and to publish it on an international level. What's really key that you must look at is the student community. Community, You're going to be spending uh, possibly a quarter of your life to date here, and there's no greater city than Prague to do that. So we have, we're very proud of our MedSoc, our Medical Student Union. This is a group of students who look after students, run by students, for students, who look after the needs of the students. And they'll interact with you from now, LF1 MedSoc. You can look for them on uh, Facebook, on Instagram, on, on uh, so all social media, they're there. And if you want help or advice or, or information, they'll happily interact with you. And when you start, they'll, they arrange the freshers week, uh, they have uh, study modules, tutoring, uh, and also parties as well. Um, simulation education, uh, is a critical part of education. That's how we are progressing in medical education, advancing medical education. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, what's really key is the rotations and exchanges that we offer for you abroad. Medicine is medicine. The diseases are the diseases. But as COVID proved to us, you know, we've been dealing with coronavirus for ever. But for some reason, this specific coronavirus didn't act like other coronaviruses. And we needed to deal with it differently. But every healthcare system dealt with it in a different manner to others. So we, we know that it's important that for you, our students, 
to gain experience in the healthcare system in which you wish to work upon graduation. Our aim is to help you achieve the maximum of your potential, not just at medical school, but for life beyond. So we enable you, we have a, a network of, of a global network of hospitals and universities with whom we work, enabling you to do rotations, uh, during your clinical years especially, but sometimes even preclinical for exchanges like the Erasmus program, which is a European uh, government-backed exchange system, um, IFMSA. So you can get this experience from other healthcare systems or in the country in which you wish to practice upon graduation. Um, the degrees we offer in English. So medicine is a six year MD, Doctor of Medicine. And all these courses we're talking about today are taught entirely in English. In medicine, we have about 150 places a year that we can offer. And it's about nine to one applicants per place available. Dentistry is a five year Doctor of Dentistry or BDS equivalent. Um, there are about 30 places on offer uh, every year. And the competition is a little bit easier. It's about six to one, five to one uh, in applicants per place available. We also have more than 20 PhD programs in English that you can study as an MD, PhD, a combined study, if you have had the capacity or you're daring enough. Or when you finish your medical education, you can go on to study the PhD, uh, which is a four year course. And there is no tuition fees for that either. Also new to the field is uh, addictology. This is a world leading course uh, built by a very famous professor Miofsky, who's known across the globe and has very close relations with America. This is a course which is done in parallel with America, very practical and unique. It's for a master's program, two years in English, specializing in addictology. Um, and the, it is, I don't know the details uh, of the competition for this, but I think it is very, very quickly becoming fully booked out. So if you're interested in addictology or you think you might be or know someone might be, get in touch with us quickly uh, to be able to study with that program. So how do you get to study with us? Well, um, Medical Doorway is a long-term partner, as, as Mr. Ambrose said. Uh, Medical Doorway is a counselling service, so they will advise you on different options, different possibilities, but they are very much um, a partner of our faculty, so you can apply directly through Medical Doorway, uh, and in fact there is an exam that Medical Doorway have organised in Hong Kong uh, later on this year, in June, uh, of the, sorry, May of this year. May the 27th is the Hong Kong exam, to coincide about one week after the end of the IB exams. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, so you can do it at home or, or, or your home country, uh, local to you. There are other ways of applying. You can come to Prague, and that one is in June, uh, which, Mr. Nikola, if you can remind me the date of the June exam, Uh, you're uh, muted. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, in June. It's June 9th. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So June the 9th here in Prague, uh, if you want to come to visit Prague and see us here in Prague. Um, tuition fees. It's it's the In the Czech Republic, they're very adamant about keeping their currency. Uh, the Czech crown It's quite strong at the moment. Um, it's about 500,000 uh, Czech crowns per year which will be held for those six years or five years that you're studying, which equates to around about 21,000 euros, $22,000 per year. But as we mentioned earlier, there are governments that uh, fund the students. We're beginning negotiation with the Hong Kong government uh, for this as well. Um, or if you have a German passport, a Scandinavian passport, American passport, so on and so forth, that those countries also will fund you. Then we get to the difficult bit, uh, the exam. So it's important to understand that we are an international school of medicine and dentistry. We take students from all over the world with all different high school examination systems, secondary school examination systems. So some of you might be doing A-levels, some of you might be doing IB, some of you might be doing the CBSE, some of you might be doing uh, the Chinese system and so on and so forth. It would be unfair of me to specify exact grades for each system because there's no direct comparison and they're never exactly equal therefore we have our own admissions exam entrance exam which you must pass and that is equal across the globe in any one academic year so i do not specify any um exact grades that you require 
You need to complete your high school education as per the law in your country. Therefore, we're not age specific either. There are some people that complete it at age 17. That's fine by us. I also have a lady who is, I think, in her fourth or fifth year that is 67 years old. And that's absolutely fine with us. We don't care about your age, your gender, your uh, sexuality, your race, religion, anything like that. We care about what's inside here. Therefore, we have our own entrance exam. We have more than 120 staff that work on these entrance exams every year. They're highly calibrated. The first part is the application. When you put in your application, you must also submit um, a personal statement, a motivation letter, something similar to UCAS, but direct for us. We want to know why you're choosing us, why you're choosing us over the other medical schools and why we should choose you over the next nine applicants. So those gold medals you want at the Olympics and those leadership skills that you have and there's other wonderful things about you. But we want to know that you know about medicine, that you've got work experience, that you know a little bit about Prague. Um, therefore, we can be proud of you. Um, that part will be added into your interview when you get to do your interviews. Then you'll sit the entrance exam, which... Um, Ben is very kindly putting the dates that there's also in London, uh, as well as in Prague, uh, several dates available. So you have options. The exam is a multiple choice, positive marked exam on biology, chemistry and physics. Usually when I say physics, I hear this kind of groan. Oh, no, but I've done maths, not physics. Maths is brilliant. Maths is good. Um, physics is just applied mathematics. But to be a doctor or a dentist, you don't need advanced mathematics. You need to be able to add, subtract, to multiply and divide. But you need physics every single day of your medical career. You need to be able to understand if you're doing a hip implant, an orthopedic surgeon, the torsion on the metal. You need to be understand the, um, the, the, the uh, radiation and, and uh, uh, all sorts of other things, physics principles, uh, as my mind immediately blanks on every physics principle that we do. But <laughs> on every day of your life, you will be working with physics. So you need to have an understanding of physics. If you don't study physics now, that's not a problem. You probably did study physics uh, a few years ago. You'll need to do a bit of work. Uh, Medical Doorway have some advice they can give you on that. They have some past papers they can help you with. Uh, on our website, there's further sample questions. Um, I suggest doing some reading of kind of A-level physics uh, or IB-level physics um, principles. So when you when you pass the written exam, uh, you move on to the interviews. The interviews are MMI, multiple mini interviews done online via Zoom, unless you're here in the Prague exam. Um, and it's four different stations looking at other principles about you. Your knowledge has been examined in the written paper. We don't care about your knowledge anymore. It's now looking at you, your communication skills, your ethical balance, your out-of-the-box thinking, judgments, so on and so forth. Um, they're all done double-blind. Uh, and so the examiners don't know who you are. They don't know what grades you got in your exam or in the other interviews. Um, and all the points are put together within about two weeks we then are able to give you an offer. And so we hopefully welcome you to, to Prague. Uh, the one thing we will need, so we, we don't offer, it's not conditional or unconditional. The all offers, once we offer you a place, it's unconditional with exception of you must complete your secondary education. So before you start with us, we'll need to have that nostrified certificate from your, from your school saying that you have completed your, your secondary education. Studying with us, Medicine, um, we have a, a more traditional way of teaching, which is, uh, I don't want you to think that it's just purely traditional. We have a very young, we might be very old in, in age, but we have a very young way of thinking. We maintain that youth by our students. What I mean by that is the academic senate of the faculty, which is the governing body of the faculty that decides who the dean is, what the educational curriculum are, what the funding is. 50%, half of that board is made up of students elected every three years. The whole board is elected every three years. 50% are students, 50% are staff. So the students have a huge input into everyday life, the running of their faculty, because you are, we are all one family. The course is, the first three years is predominantly theoretical, predominantly preclinical, and the last three years are predominantly clinical studies. What I mean by that, 
is we want to give you solid basis of knowledge, uh, foundation on which to learn to be able to understand further and further and further on. So for instance, you cannot truly understand physiology, how things work, if you don't know the anatomy of the, what the things are in the first place. So you've got to know what the bits are to then understand how they work. So we progress through that. But you will, from the first year, be interacting with patients. You'll have first aid, you'll have nursing, you'll have other things, you'll be on the wards. And you will start that simulation education from year one as well. As we go through the years, it increases. By the third year, you've got these uh, uh, ward-based subjects, which are internal medicine, introduction to internal, internal medicine, introduction to surgery. And by the fourth year, you're doing just clinical rotation, clinical rotation, clinical rotation, neurosurgery, respiratory medicine, um, ENT, you know, throat surgery, um, uh, cardiology. And each few weeks, you'll be rotating through different subjects. In dentistry, it's very similar. And about halfway through the second year, you will start seeing and treating live patients. And from the third year, it's just treating live patients. In the first years, the first year is very similar to medicine, but you have also all the dental things to learn. And it's important to understand that dentistry is a very practical subject. I'm qualified in both medicine and dentistry. Medicine I studied here many years ago when I had some hair. Dentistry I studied at King's College many years later because I specialize in head, neck and face surgery. I worked as a surgeon and I thought I was pretty good uh, until I started studying dentistry when I realized that my one millimeter uh, limits was huge when in dentistry we're talking about um, nanometers of difference. So in dentistry, you have to use that to get that muscle memory of doing things again and again and again and again in the laboratories, on the high-tech mannequins, uh, on plastic teeth and on real teeth, and then you go to live patients. So it's a lot of work. It's much harder in that respect for the dentist than it is for the medics, um, because you will have the responsibility from halfway through your second year with a very fast moving drill putting into a live patient's mouth. Um, okay, simulations we mentioned, uh, we've got some beautiful pictures here. At the top, you've got the dental labs. At the bottom, you've got the medical labs uh, with these very high tech mannequins, some of which cost uh, more than half a million uh, euros. Um, and that you'll be, in fact, we just had this weekend an ALS course for our students, um, advanced life support done through simulation um, with a mixture of the mannequins and live people uh, for education. Um, living costs. In fact, at this point, maybe um, Mr. Nicola, would you like to take over to, to talk about the living costs? I think you're you're probably more closer than I am on that. Uh, all right. Uh for sure i'm i'm happy to uh, step in and talk about the living costs and studying in the first faculty of medicine charles university uh as you can see the minimum average living costs are approximately 7000 us per year and it's when i'm talking about university accommodation so living in our dormitories the basic transportation the basic food uh the living costs uh, in in package as as such such uh, a lot of our first year students decide to stay in the university dormitories we recommend it to them especially if they do not know anyone in the country they are new to to the city to the university life but when students get older or if they already know, have a friends they often decide to stay in private accommodation in the area near our buildings our hospital uh, so that's a lot of that's what a lot of our students do. Of course, you need to take in mind that the um, uh, living costs in private accommodation are higher than staying in the university dormitories. Dr. Brisman already mentioned our student organization, METSOC, so I will just mention it briefly once again. They will help you with... Uh, with a lot, I would say, with everything you need during your studies. So they do events, uh, not only academic events, but also social sport events. Uh, they make your life easier here in Prague. And when you get older, when you are not only the first year student, they are also welcome new members every year to help them with, with the rest of the activities that they do for, for our students. 
And when it comes to other support, um, when it comes to accommodation that I already mentioned, it's guaranteed for international students in uh, our dormitories. Um, I was um, looking at the Q&A and some questions and I saw the question about the accommodation and if it's available only for, for girls and women. Uh, so the dormitories are usually shared rooms. So you shared a room with one other student. And of course, it's based on, on a gender so you wouldn't be placed uh, to to a room or to a unit with with the boy if you are a girl um, but otherwise uh, in the building you will find rooms that are only for women and the rooms that are only for men and of course uh, because uh, studies might be challenging we of course offer a psychology counseling and other counseling that our students can use uh, free of charge yeah, and that would be it, maybe from our presentation. Uh, just at the end, you have our contact information and our social media that you are more than welcome to, to use if you have any questions, or you can ask us or you can ask our students from, from MedSoc. And I believe that we have a lot of interesting questions here. And you are also probably excited to hear from Dr. Chuk about his, his experience and studying in, in Prague at the first faculty of medicine so i give the floor back to you ben okay thank you uh, susanna for that i'm mm -hmm. actually going to hand over straight away to uh, dr chuck really and and uh, before we dig into the questions and there are many fantastic questions there because we've got a lot of people who joined us for this webinar well got significant numbers on youtube and facebook by the looks of it as well so what i'm going to do aaron if you can just talk us a bit of through your journey to actually let's take you from like your your, your day of your entrance exam for Charles University, and then how you ended up getting this residency position in, in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, in one of the most competitive parts of the US to get a residency, especially as an international medical graduate. So if you spend a few minutes talking through that, and that's give the people on the recording, as well as those who are live with us today, a bit of an appreciation of the journey that you went through. Of course, cool, Ben. Thank you so much for having me today. And uh, so, hey guys, my name is Aaron. I'm from Hong Kong originally. Um, I actually did my undergraduate studies at King's College London uh, when I was uh, studying biomedical sciences there. Um, so during my last year of study, I was actually trying to look for uh, a medical school to get in because, you know, doing medicine is always like one of my biggest passion in my life. So I was looking, when I was searching, I was searching on, uh, you know, some European medical school and also like English and American medical school as well. Um, so one thing that I found out was uh, uh, at that time, um, European medical school generally, they provide a really competitive sort of pricing in terms of the tuition fee. So like, that's the, the main reason why I reached out to Ben, uh, which I actually, I was Googling randomly actually on, on internet and I found out uh, amazing medical doorway at that time. Um, so I reached out to Ben and he's the most friendly guy ever. And, um, you know, I, I was just talking to him, explaining my concerns and my ambitions. And that's how I actually arranged an uh, entrance exam in London at that time, you know, I was there. So, you know, that, that, that was helpful. And after I sat the entrance exam, I pretty much know right away my score. So I knew at that time that I got in already. So I just packed my bags and I, I flew to Prague. Um, so during my early years... I usually have to get the visa in, 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 the, in, in between that, which I will obviously talk about <laughs> a bit later, Aaron. But... Yeah, I, we'll talk about that later. Um, it is not that hard, to be honest, to get that. Um, I was able to get everything sorted within a month time. Um, but, you know, in general, you have to, like, for, to study in Prague, you have to renew your visa every single year before. It's not like UK or US when you're granted a visa, you are, you, you'll be able to stay until the end of your studies. Um, so that is another topic. Um, but anyways, during preclinical medicine, um, I was doing all my subjects and, you know, uh, all the practicals. I saw one questions in the Q&A sessions about practicals. And in general, um, the practicals are very, very, uh, uh, they're very interactive and they would allow you to sort of like do the experiment yourself and also like to, to, to brainstorm with the group to, to find out the 
so to speak, the best solution to, to tackle the problems that's being given to you. So that is really, really good way to actually like just make sure that you are, you know, you, you are thinking on, on your own and that will eventually help you in your internal school exam as well. And I find particularly uh, in my preclinical studies in Charles University, it really prepared me a lot for USMLE exams. Uh, in fact, um, our preclinical studies are one of the strongest I've ever, uh, you know, experienced in, in in any of the other other uh, in any of the schools that I attended. Um, and because of that, I didn't really spend a lot of time doing USMLE uh, preparing for USMLE Step One. Um, that was like the biggest advantage of going to Charles University. And then I went to do my uh, Step Two CK exam in my final year of study and I was applying for the residency spots and you know I got in so that was very I'm very grateful for that um, and during the year the gap year I was uh, doing some unpaid clinical works in the US as well to bridge the gap because you know the US application they generally they, they take a year they take half a year to apply and it's interview seasons and also you know I was doing something and also um, the research at Harvard as well. So I'm still currently doing it, to be honest, um, before the uh, the start of my residency in July. So yeah, that's a, the, my journey, basically. Wonderful. And it's, you know, it's 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 a six year pathway, Aaron, but it, it races by, doesn't it? You know, and yes. we'll talk a bit with some of the questions, but life in Prague as a student, it's one of the best student cities you can live in, in terms of, you know, opportunities that you get across the six years. And I think we'll talk about about those. Let's go through some of the questions, if that's okay, and then at some point I'll dig in with the visa. There's a couple of simple questions that will get out of the way just very quickly. We won't go everything, through everything chronologically. For those who are asking about the recording, the best way to look at the recording is simply go to Medical Doorway on YouTube, click on webinars and presentations. It's definitely going to be there because as it's live streamed, it automatically saves. So just go to you, uh, Medical Doorway on YouTube. You'll be able to see the recording there. If you want to share the recording, you can share the recording as well. That's the best, best way of doing it. Okay. Right. Let's go through the questions. Uh, someone's asked, how many year years is this course if you're a postgrad? Well, the program is always six years for students, because that's what the accreditation is. But I'll hand over to uh, Professor Brisbane to talk a little bit more about that and what other options there are if you're a graduate. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, before we start the question, the Q&A session, it's really important that you know the, the, the most important rule, the first rule. The first rule is all questions are good questions. There is no such thing as a silly question. You'll hear me repeat this to you when you come to be a student here. Uh, I say it all the time. There is no such thing as a, as a silly question. If you are thinking of a question, all I ask is that you are brave enough to ask it because someone else may not be so brave. Undoubtedly, someone else is thinking of the question. Just need you to be the brave one to ask the question. So please, we've got this opportunity. Uh, all questions are good questions. So studies here, um, by law, you have to pass the entrance exam. For those of you who have studied medicine before, want to study dentistry, or vice versa, have studied dentistry, want to study medicine, then there is uh, the ability to not have to take the written part of the exam, uh, but you you will still need to take the interviews uh, session from it. If you studied some medical related subject, or you've studied part of the degree elsewhere, then depending upon the difficulty of that subject, how many credits it, it, it uh, has uh, assigned to it, uh, what the syllabus was like, then uh, and your grades in that subject, then they can be counted towards your studies here. So we can create something called an individual study plan. Subjects from above the first year have prerequisites. So for instance, physiology, you need to know anatomy to study physiology, therefore you must pass anatomy to do physiology. Or the, the clinical subjects, pharmacology, you must, pre, you must have passed. So, um, with this individual study plan, it can be tailored quite a bit according to what you have done, providing you have completed those prerequisites for those higher year subjects. So you could do almost two years or three years in one year. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to deal with a, a simple question about when to apply, because a couple of people have asked that question. It's important because the application process, it's not, it's not a simple question. It's a very pertinent question because actually the application system is very different. 
So we're going to, for those people that have asked questions about when you apply, let's pull them all together and, we, and the exams as well. Firstly, we open for applications in November before the year that you will be enrolling. So for those that are enrolling in September 2023, this year we've been open for applications since November 2022, since we do our open day there. You apply when you're or in your final year of high school, or if you're after, or if you finished high school. So someone said, do I apply after my A-levels are finished? No, because it's then far too late to apply. The applications close for first faculty on the 30th of April every year, okay? Linked into that, the exams, all the exam dates that are on our website and on the Charles University website are for enrollment this coming September. So in the, for those that are used to the UK, you apply the October the 15th, for enrollment next year. It's a similar system, except you apply by April the 30th, but that's not simply to start your application. At that stage, we will need to have your personal statement. We will need to have your payment for the university application fee, and we'll need to have an idea of which exam we're booking you in for, because their you know, exam seats do get taken up. So we need to make sure your entire application is done and submitted and paid for by the end of April of 2023, for September 2023 enrollment. Now, I do have to say, if you are applying from certain parts of the world, even April can be quite late, because if you do get accepted, it can take time to get the visa. Uh, the visa is not doesn't take the same for everyone. Some people, it can take longer, depending on the kinds of documentation you need to get together. I won't go into the details now. It's far too detailed. We will deal with that on an individual basis. But at Medical Doorway, we work directly with embassies all over the world, especially in London, the consulate in Hong Kong, where myself and Professor Brisbane and Marina from Medical Doorway held a meeting last uh, February. And we also work with the uh, consulate embassy in the UAE for Medical Doorway students as well. However, if you're in your final year of school, you can apply now. And my advice is do not delay. The earlier we get the application in, that stress is gone and we can start going through preparation for the entrance exams. So uh, for the person who asked about doing it after A-levels are finished, no, we need the application done now. And it can be done in 10 minutes on the Medical Doorway website. We can even book you in for exams in Prague if you want to take the exam in Prague as well. You don't have to take one of the exams in London or in Hong Kong. So... Uh, so the person who asked, is the exam in April for 2023 intake? Yes, it is. So all the exams, both April, May in Hong Kong, and then June dates in Prague are all for September 2023 enrollment. Okay. Uh, let's go right to the top. Okay. Someone said, as a Hong Kong student, if I'm interested to study dentistry in Europe, what is the option admission requirement and other recommendation? Well, as you've seen in the presentation, you can study dentistry at Charles University, and we've got many students and graduates uh, from Charles University who are working in the UK. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether you're a Hong Kong student or whatever, okay? You can study dentistry at uh, Charles University and have access to some fantastic facilities. And I think one of the benefits of Charles University, uh, I think Professor Brisbane will back me up on this, is the fact that Charles University is linked with, with a lot of dental employers in the UK. I think uh, for this particular student who's looking at dentistry, uh, Professor, would you have anything else to add to that? I think that's that's really accurate what you've said, Ben. Um we are, I mean, some of the big conglomerates like My Dentists, like uh, Dental Partners, Rodericks, um, so on and so forth, these huge conglomerates that have hundreds of clinics throughout the whole of the UK, they will be actively recruiting you from your clinical years. And you can do some summer rotations with them as well. But all of our students who want to work in the UK after graduation have job offers. What's also interesting from dentistry is we were the first and the only school uh, of dentistry outside the UK to have students accepted directly onto the uh, vocational training team, the, the uh, foundation years of dentistry. No other school outside of the UK has ever had that beforehand. And we have, for the last few years, had two students every year for the last five or six years accepted directly onto this, this scheme. What's important to know is the admissions are the same, the requirements are the same, um, pretty much the same. The, the, the scores needed are a little bit lower than the scores of medicine. Uh, because of the competition ratios, but uh, the studies are just as hard, if not harder. Um, and for the UK market that was asked about, it's automatic full registration in the GDC. So no exams. 
as soon as you graduate, the degree is automatically recognized. You just apply to the GDC. Within about three weeks, you have your recognition. The same for medicine. If you want to work in the UK, within about three weeks of your graduation, you just put in the documents into the G General Medical Council of the UK. Everything's done. No exams. Straight into the job. And that, that's actually you've answered one of the other questions there. Someone asked a question about Brexit because it's the elephant in the room for many British students, especially those coming to work in the UK. No. As it stands at the moment, and this is on the GMC website, on the GDC website, there has been no significant change regarding recognition of the programmes. In fact, the GDC has even got a list of programmes it recognises for direct admission prior to Brexit, which were predominantly programmes in Australia, et cetera. Uh, but as it stands at the moment, there is no exam that you have to take if you wish to register with the GDC or the GMC if you qualify from uh, Charles University in Prague. We can't say that's not going to be the same in five years' time. No, we can't predict what's going to happen in five, five months' time. But as I said, there is a long track record of dentists and doctors working in the UK. Just to give you some numbers that the GMC gave me, there are over 1,200 graduates from across Charles University registered with the GMC in the UK. That is a huge number, a significant number. Uh, so as a result, you can see automatically why both medical and dental employers, especially in the UK, are really, you know, trying to fight over each other for access to the graduates that come from Charles University. Right, let's go um, back to something else. I'm going to fix, st stick with the entrance exam for a minute. We might as well stay on that, on that theme. Someone said, can I take the exam in Singapore? No, the nearest exam centre for you will be Hong Kong. Uh, we could run exams all over the world and have like two or three people in the exams. That's not time efficient, really. So what we do is we run exams in big hubs regionally so you can take the exam local to you. So that will be if we're kind of if you're in Singapore, or anywhere in Southeast Asia, Japan, South Korea, mainland China, or even Australia, New Zealand. Hong Kong is going to be the closest uh, point for you. And Hong Kong is open now. Uh, we, we traveled there back in February. The travel's opened up now, and it's been a very good center to have for running the exams. We've had many students come to Hong Kong from different countries where they would need a visa to take the exam in the Czech Republic or other countries. So Hong Kong is generally an open area to take the exam. Someone's asked about the average IB level or A level score for students accepted. In fact, as Professor Brisman said before, admission is based on the entrance exam, and it's the entrance exam itself which is used to select you. Now, there is uh, a, a uh, caveat to that. You don't need a particular score, but you do need to graduate with your three A levels or IB to go through this what's called nostrification process. So unlike in the UK, where your offer is conditional on certain grades or on certain points on the IB, that's not the case for Charles. But what I do have to say is that the entrance exam is not a simple tick box exercise. As Professor Brisbane told you, the program is heavily oversubscribed. So the exam is tough and it should be tough. You don't expect to go to a program, let's say at Oxford or Cambridge, you walk into there. Neither that's going to be the case at the 10th oldest medical school in the world. So if you're not a student performing highly on the IB or the uh, a levels, then don't expect to find the exam easy. Okay, what we do find is that students who prepare for the exam, in addition to what they're doing on their IB or A levels, do actually do better. Uh, one of our students recently took another exam and did exceptionally well, and that's because he spent time preparing it, in, preparing for the exam in a very systematic, systematic way. Okay, uh, let's kind of look at any more questions related to the exam. And there's no negative marking, as Professor Brisbane said. The exam is not negatively marked. You start off with zero and work your way up. And what I'm going to do in that is I'm going to hand over to, oh, someone asked about physics as well. They weren't taking physics. Very few of our applicants actually have physics at A level or on the IB. Most do take maths if their third A level is that and find the maths is great preparation as long as you do additional work to refine that knowledge. In Medical Doorway, we have our online learning program to help you prepare for that. It doesn't give you the magic bullet. It doesn't tell you what's going to come up in the exam. We've actually had it designed by people that have assessed the broader curriculum for the entrance exam and developed a program that focuses your knowledge in, in those areas. Okay, I think uh, Susan, there's someone's asked a question about the hostel. That's been answered there. I think Susanna answered that uh, before. OK, uh, and then someone's asked about how safe is Prague for women? Well, as we have a uh, woman online, Susanna, can you tell us a bit about Prague and, and its safety? Because 
one thing everyone thinks about is safety. And when they arrive in Prague, they realize actually they shouldn't really have been worried about safety in the Czech Republic generally or in Prague as a capital. Yes, Ben, you are definitely right. Exactly what you said that like in Prague, you don't have to worry about the safety. Uh, Prague is actually one of the safest cities in the world. Also, Czech Republic is one of the safest countries in the world. If you look at the rankings, we are right at the top with the with the countries and the cities of the of the nord northern Europe. Uh, so there is no need to feel afraid in Prague. Or, Myself as a as a woman, I feel completely safe uh, in Prague. Um, uh, I was raised elsewhere. I'm not I'm not coming from Prague originally. I moved here for university as well. Uh, so as a, as a young girl or lady who came here, um, I never been afraid to in Prague. There is a lot of international students and also experts studying and living in Prague. Sometimes I have a feeling that I hear English more often than than a Czech language when I. I'm on a public uh, transportation, so you have always somebody to ask for for help if you do not understand. Uh, so there is really no feeling to be afraid. And as Dr. Brisman mentioned, we have about 800 international students, and about half of them are women. Yeah. Now, the one thing I'll, I always say when uh, for those people that are perhaps coming from Singapore or Hong Kong or the UK is I compare often the uh, the experience in, in those cities to, to Prague. In London, Singapore and Hong Kong, you have barriers on the on the metro system, on the undergrounds. We have very antiquated ones in London, in Singapore and Hong Kong. We have much more modern ones. In Prague, they don't even bother with barriers on the underground. You simply walk on and off the trains. Aaron, you can tell us, as you've been a student there, how much does it cost a year for your travel permit for uh, for Prague as a student? Well, um, time has changed. I mean, when I got in, it was with a student card. It was about like if I if I have to say in Czech crowns, it's like seven hundred and twenty crowns a a month, which is approximately like 200 Hong Kong dollars or maybe pounds. $30 or something for a month. So it is relatively affordable. Now I think the price has gone up a little bit, but still very affordable, yeah. Yeah, oh, uh, if I may, just it's really affordable for a year ticket for a student. It's approximately 60, 70 euros per year. So for the whole year to use it unlimitedly. Yeah, you use your student travel permit, get the card and it's unused and literally you just have it in your pocket all the time. You don't scan it, you don't swipe it. If someone asks for it, you show them. It's very, very simple and a trust-based a trust based system. Uh, Aaron's answered a few questions I can just see there, but just to re-for re those people that aren't uh, able to read them, just someone's asked, are all the courses in English or some are most in Czech? As in, everything is in English. The whole program is taught in English. They actually have two degrees, parallels, one taught in English for the international students and one taught in Czech for the local students. So unlike in the UK, where you are, as international students, a small smidgen on the top of all the domestic students. You're on an entirely English taught program, but you will learn Czech as part of, of the degree. And people often ask me about that question, how do I learn the Czech? So I think uh, I think there's two ways we can look at this. If Professor Brisman or uh, Ms. Hanikova give us the details on how that's taught, and then Aaron can tell us about his experience of learning Czech as part of the degree. Uh, so if I may begin, then we we do teach you Czech for the first three years of your studies here, compulsory lessons in Czech, both get around town Czech as to ask, you know, how much is, where is and so on and so forth, as well as medical Czech so you can communicate with patients. I think it is very important when we are guests here in this country that we do try and learn their language and especially to communicate with patients. We firmly believe that if a patient is unwell and admitted to hospital, it's not appropriate to be asking that patient to speak in a foreign language whilst they're in pain or, or, or suffering in any way. There are, as Mr. Nicola said, there are a lot of expats living here. Uh, so you do get to speak English quite a bit. We guarantee that all six years of your education is taught in English. So whenever we teach you, it's in English. If your check is not up to scratch by the time you're at the clinical years, then there is always someone there to translate for you. Um, and there is also the opportunity of doing the clinical rotations in a country where you might be native speaking uh, the language. 
uh, from across the world. We have this global network. Mr. Nikola, maybe I'll let you take over from that bit, then maybe Dr. Chuk. I believe you said the thing that was needed to be said, yeah, about about the learning Czech. Some of the students then decide to stay in the Czech Republic after after graduation as they love the city and country as much. As many of them decide to go back home and they can practice Czech language afterwards as well, yeah. Aaron, your experience of learning Czech as someone who perhaps didn't even know a single word when they arrived in Prague, because the thing is, as, as uh, Susanna said earlier, English is spoken so broadly in Prague, all the announcements on the underground, the buses are in English, every shop or restaurant or cafe you'll go into is, is you'll have people speaking fluent English because Czech citizens are taught English from like five years of age. But how did you find, you know, picking up Czech as a, as a, as an international student? Honestly, to me is relatively easy um, because like from day one, the uh, university has already got like courses for you, like lay down. And mm -hmm. they start off by teaching you some really basic words. And then you learn how to make a sentence out of it. And quite frankly, if you live in a city where everybody is speaking Czech and English, you slowly will learn it. You know, it's, it's, it's not really, it's really not that hard. Uh, you know, by the end of third year, you do have to pass an exam, but like the exam will be uh, relatively lenient. They they know that you all of you are international students, and then you know at the end they, they will always try to help you. Uh, as for clinical years, as Dr. Brisbane said, um, if you do not know the language or you do not know, like know the language very well, um, there will always be someone who's trying to translate to you. Uh, but obviously, like if you do speak a little bit try to use it with a patient because, you know, as doctors, we can't really expect the patient to speak your language. So that's just the professional side of it. So, but in terms of like learning the language, it's actually not that hard, to be honest. Okay, wonderful. Right, let's carry on going through. I'm not going to answer the questions in the order they're in because I'm going to try and theme them a little bit as if that's okay for everyone. Someone's asked about, do I need a visa if I'm an EU citizen? No, you do not. You can enjoy freedom of movement. So once you've been accepted, you can go. Just for one, for British students on that, okay, British students do need a visa now to go to the Czech Republic to study, but you don't need the visa to enter the country. So even if your visa has been delayed a little bit, you can actually go to the Czech Republic for 90 days visa fee, provided you've not been in the Schengen zone for any period uh, before that as well. So what many of our British students do actually do when we're going through the visa process, some actually do have to go to the Czech Republic without their visa and pop back to the UK to collect the visa once it's done. And on the visa question, someone has said a fantastic question. They understand that they're getting the Czech student visa is a cumbersome process and it needs to be renewed every year. Actually, I'm going to disagree with you slightly there. It's not a cumbersome process if you are prepared and if you get the documents ready in good time and if you communicate to the embassy that you're going to apply with. If you're coming through Medical Doorway, we do most of that for you anyway, and we work directly with the embassies. Second thing, the visa doesn't need to be renewed every year. You actually don't. The visa lasts for one year. And when you're in the Czech Republic, you apply for your residency permit. And it's that that you renew every year. Aaron, I think as you are a, an international student from Hong Kong who needed to go through that process, can you just di direct us through exactly what you did every year to maintain your registration? Yeah, of course. Um, so at the beginning, you go to the Czech consulate in Hong Kong, which is located, I think, in Wan Chai or something. I, I, I'm not entirely... Like, Same sure. great, great harbor building, Wan Chai. Yeah. Was it? Okay, cool. Um, so like you go there for the first time, you sort out your visa and then before you go home for holiday each year, you, you have to report yourself to the, um, the interior embassy in Czech Republic to renew your visa before you go home. And after that, it will last for another year because that is the time when you get study confirmation from the first faculty uh, proving that you will still be a student next year. So that's the best time to do it. And do not forget it. That's uh, my biggest take home. I'm muted. Sorry about that. Uh, someone's asked a few other things. Let's go through some of the simple, some of the uh, small questions first. Okay. Uh, and if I could just on, on that point, first add one, one little comment. Um, we, the university, the faculty, uh, we see your time here with us as not just education about medicine, but education for life. 
Mm. So we treat you as adults in everything that we do from the way we teach you. We don't spoon feed you. We expect you to, we teach you how to study, to go out and find information. Your visa is your prerogative. Uh, it's not the university that is, is looking after you. We're not going to mummy you. Um, it's your responsibility. So uh, in the same way you have to pay rent, the same way you have to, we're not going to pay your rent for you. We're not going to do all the other things for you. You need to sort out your visa to make sure that you are able to do your studies to the best of your abilities. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's asked, I'm a Slovak student. Do I need to learn Czech? Uh, the answer is yes, but I can't imagine it's going to be much of a problem. So <laughs> it's a brilliant. Yeah. Well, um, Czech language and Slovak language, please forgive me that I am not uh, either. Um, but for my ears, they are similar, not the same, but they're similar. Um, like I mentioned slightly earlier, they have the ability that if you've uh, studied something beforehand, if it's seen as an equivalent, you can get recognition for it. Uh, we have Czech students studying in our international course in the English language course. We have Slovak students studying in our international course. For the language, the compulsory language part of the uh, exam, of the curriculum in the first three years, all you need to do is speak to the teachers. They are human. They understand the situation. Um, if your Czech is reasonable, then uh, they may just want to see your high school diploma to confirm it, or you do a simple exam, which will, you don't need to revise for if you're a native Slovak speaker. Uh, and it'll be recognised so you can then spend your time doing eligible electives or other things, or research in, in, in that time. Wonderful. Right, let's go through. Uh, someone's asked about, uh, are there any specific requirements for US citizens? And uh, are there any specific requirements for a US citizen who studied the I in IB from an international school in Africa? Well, for, if you're an IB student, even regardless of your citizenship, provided you've graduated, you're able to enroll. And actually, you, you then simple, I say simply, you need to get through the entrance exam and the, the interview system. You've also asked a question about the exam in India. We don't run exams in India. And what we're not going to do on this uh, is talk about different representatives. Uh, if you want to enroll with Medical Doorway and you're a US citizen, you can do that and you can take our exam in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, you will need a visa as a US citizen, but getting the US, getting the visa as a US citizen, especially if you apply within the United States, is fairly straightforward. Actually, we have US citizens every year. There's a separate procedure for US citizens, depending on which state you're in. And we can guide you through that. But if you want to take the medical doorway exam because you were not keen on perhaps taking it in India, yes, you can do that. But obviously, it's up to you where you take the exam. Uh, just get in contact with Medical Doorway after today's webinar. I'm going to show everyone the website in a while on how you can make the application in no more than ten minutes with Medical Doorway as well. Uh, Andrew Ambrose, if I may, um, just with Americans. Um, Checks are not biased. There was a question, I think, also about uh, LGBTQ. Yeah. This is the most, this, this is bohemia. This is the most open-minded people you could ever meet. We don't care about your race, your religion, your color, your creed, your whatever you want to do. We don't care where you come from. What we care about is what you've got up here. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, LGBTQ, the country is extremely open with that and it is legal, very legal uh, and uh, welcomed for you to be and do whatever you want with whomever you want, providing everyone is consenting. Um, with Americans, the advantage you have for America is that you have the full government federal recognition, you can get the full federal loan. Uh, and if you're uh, from a veteran family or a veteran yourself, you get the, the GI Bill with it as well. And linked to that, someone's asked, what are the requirements to take the AP curriculum? Like I said, it's all based on the entrance exam. I would say if you're taking the American curriculum, having APs, biology in chemistry and calculus are obviously, you know, going to help you prepare suit more suitably for the entrance exam, as opposed to just the basic high school diploma. Uh, the APs do generally support very well for that, especially if you're taking the sciences. Uh, someone's asked. No, we are also... So we are also in negotiation with Medical Doorway at the moment as to whether we have quite a lot of interest from in America this year, uh, really quite a bit of interest. So we're, we're looking whether we can arrange the last minute an exam, maybe in June uh, in the States, probably uh, New York side of things, uh, but depending on where the vast majority are. So we're still in negotiation for this Medical Doorway. I can't promise we'll be able to hold a physical exam in the States, but we'll try to. I think one thing I'm going to say is that the exams are back to in-person again this year. This is the first year they've been back to in-person. Things are still recovering after COVID because, as you can imagine, universities work on academic cycles. So, so from September to September. So what can be very difficult is that, you know, getting back into that cycle again does take a whole year or even sometimes two years 
to get back to that cycle. So, and, uh, and with people not as used to traveling, especially those people who were in school, who were doing lots online, it's taken a bit of time to get back to that uh, system where we can have exams in all the different locations we were running them uh, before. Uh, someone's asking about teaching style. Okay. I think we did deal with a lot of that in the presentation, but I think that's definitely something we can talk about, about how the teaching style and the examination style, actually, when you're at the university works, how that actually works. Uh, if I might begin, and maybe I'll let uh, Dr. Chuck carry on. Um, I studied medicine here. I studied dentistry at King's College in London. Um, here we value people. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, our education is to, you know, we want to give you everything. We want to give you all of our knowledge, all of our experience to help you become the best you can be. We have this thing called consultations so that uh, in any subject, in every subject, you can arrange a private consultation, you know, one-to-one, two-to-one, five-to-one with the professors um, at you know, mutual convenience throughout the year. When I was in my second year here, then uh, I wasn't uh, confident in my biochemistry. So I arranged with the then head of biochemistry and I met with him uh, every week. In fact, for years, not just talking about biochemistry, we became good friends. Uh, and I've maintained friendships with the professors I made here, even uh, till now. At King's, I was a doctor already. I was a surgeon already when I went to King's uh, in London. And I'm an, you know, I'm an alumnus of, of, of King's, but... I didn't have that relationship. There wasn't the student professor relationship that they have here. It's a really, really close community. And with the exams, um, again, we want to train you to become the best doctors and dentists in the world. And we don't have written exams as a major part of our exams. And they're definitely not parts of your finals because as long as I've been a surgeon, you know, I graduated medicine in 2004, not once has a patient come to me and said, Dr. Brisman, could you please write me an essay on my diagnosis? Just two sides, that's, that's fine. Never happened. But every single patient interaction that I have, there is an oral exam by the patient on me. And it's not a fair exam because I like my patients to have a loved one, a carer with them to support them during the interaction. I might have a nurse there. I might have some junior doctors some medical students with me. So I'm being examined by this patient in front of a crowd. And it's not further not fair because the patient won't necessarily just ask me about the specific diagnosis that they came in with. They could ask me about anything and everything. And I have to be ready, prepared to give them the appropriate answer, understandable answer with empathy uh, for the situation for them. We also, because we want you to be an adult and we know the exams are difficult, uh, time management is a very key part of growing up uh, studying. So within any, within any given academic year, you can choose when you take your exams. So once you finish the credits, you gain the credits for a subject, you finish that subject, uh, you're eligible to sit for the exam, then the professors will publish online on the student information system a range of dates. It's not you will be taking this exam or this date, this location, this time, uh, like it is in most places. There is a range of dates that you sign up to, which is a blessing and it's a curse because you can choose the date that you want to sign the, and do the exam. But then again, you have to work to your own deadline for that. Um, and the exams may have several different parts. I think if I remember pathology, and I'll probably pass over to Dr. Chuck for this pathology. Uh, there was a, uh, you had to perform an autopsy. Then you had to do a random slide test from anywhere in the body and, and to talk about uh, the pathology that you could see, the staining. There was an MCQ test. And then once you, put, you finished all those, the, the last part was uh, the oral exam. Uh, Dr. Chuck, how did you find it? Yeah, as you said, Dr. Brisman, um, I find... I I honestly find the oral exam super helpful in, in general in, in terms of um, preparing me for any sort of licensing exam in the future because it like the it for every single exam you do have like a set of question list that you have to study. Uh it's basically it's not like a particular specific questions that you have to know, but it's it's more like a topic that you have to cover. And during the oral exam in particular you will have like more like a conversation with the examiner and the examiner will sort of tease out 
what you know and what you don't know. And at the end of the day, like you guys like sit together and then you communicate and you you converse over the topic that you are not very familiar with or you you are super um, confident with, and then the exam is over. So in terms of that, it, I, I really like the you know how the exam is run. I must stress that the exams are not easy and there's more than a hundred and something exams. But, you know, um, I think Ben mentioned earlier about Oxford and Cambridge. We have with Oxford and Cambridge, especially a very close, interesting relationship during the Second World War, when the Nazis invaded what was then Czechoslovakia, invaded Prague. Uh, our students that escaped were taken in by Oxford University and given degrees the only time in history given degrees by Oxford University in the name of Charles University. And they went to such a level, I found out recently when we had an Oxford professor here uh, um, that I was just uh, chatting with, that he told me that the calligrapher who, who wrote the diplomas went and found a Charles University diploma to match the calligraphy exactly so it could be as, as original as possible as a Charles University degree given by Oxford University. Wonderful. Uh, OK, we're going to crack on with some of the questions. We've got about 20 minutes and there are more questions coming in. So let's kind of go through them and, and try and theme. And thanks, Aaron, for answering some of the ones that were directed at you uh, direct, uh, directly. OK, so thanks for answering them on offline. Right. Uh, we've dealt with how many in, how many seats there are for international students. We dealt with that in the presentation. There was we said about 160 in total, if I remember rightly. Uh, so 160 for medicine, about 30 for dentistry. Just to put it into into uh, uh, perspective, uh, we have at our faculty 160 places in the first year for medicine. In the UK, for the whole of the UK, there is about 450. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Just to get, give an idea on that, based on the cu current numbers as an international student for the UK, as well as spending a lot more money, over double what you're going to spend in the Czech Republic. The number of seats just at Charles University are easily over a quarter of what the entire UK would be. Okay, someone's asked about, someone's from Pakistan has got a British passport, will be doing their second year of A-levels uh, next year. So you'd apply, you wouldn't start in September 2023 because you need to be in your final year of school, okay? Uh, so you no, know, you apply from November of 2023 for enrollment in September of 2024. So when you've started your second year of A-levels. Someone's asked a question about the different faculties of Charles University. Well, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, and I don't think we've got the time to dig into exact details, but the way I, I say it, think of Oxford or Cambridge or the University of London made up of different components. And in, 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 like Oxford University and Cambridge have different colleges. In Charles, they have different faculties. Now, there is a bit of history, chronological history, related to what happened after the Second World War and the burgeoning population that happened across Europe, but in effect, what you've got are effectively five different medical schools that operate pseudo independently under the umbrella of Charles University, first faculty being one. Coincidentally, and Professor Brisbane won't mind me telling, we do actually have the entrance exam for second faculty of medicine on the 26th of May, the day before the Charles first faculty exam in Hong Kong as well. So practically all of our applicants for medicine will take both. First faculty is the only one with a dental program. The other two are just, the other two Prague faculties are just medicine. Okay. Uh, someone's asked about the passing grade. This, they're actually worried that the exams in medicine is stressful. What I would say is if you want a stress-free degree, do not study medicine. Okay. It's not a stress-free degree. It's one of the most stressful programs you will ever take on, but obviously one of the most rewarding. And someone's asked about the number of attempts. In fact, I'm a, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you get three attempts at all of the modules. Am I correct in that? That's right. Um, on, in, on exams as such, if it's an entrance exam, if it was meant for the entrance exam, that's only once a year. That's the, 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 the entrance exam is once per faculty, per academic year. But once you're on the program, then uh, once you're on the program, then you are uh, got three three attempts. I've noticed a question at the end, a fantastic question. Are there graduates from the school who are currently practicing medicine in Hong Kong? In fact, myself and Professor Brisbane have a Zoom call lined up with a Czech graduate who's working in Hong Kong at the moment. Uh, she's a professor at Hong Kong University, in fact. Yeah. Um, right. and if, I, if I could just drop, drop back quickly to that last question, yes. um, Mr. Nicola is absolutely right. For the entrance exam, is only one attempt per, per academic year. Uh, it's not easy. 
It's not easy. And if you've ever heard of a man called Gregor Mendel, who was the founder of all genetics, he failed our entrance exam three times. Uh, so we don't always get it quite right. Um, and within the, as Ben said, as Mr. Ambrose said, within the university, you have three attempts at each exam. I want to put one thing to you all. Um, we don't want to fail you. It's not in our interest for you to fail uh, at all. Um, in fact, our admissions process is tough because we try and filter you to only accept those people who will be able to succeed going all through the years. Um, the only, the greatest reason for failure in the faculty is students not actually attending their exam. Uh, if you don't attend the exam, we can't pass you. Uh, but we do not, the exams are not easy. That's why you have three attempts at each exam. Um, we're not going to just pass you. We have our reputation to uphold. Uh, but if you put the work in, you put the effort in, then I'm sure if you were able to pass our interest exam, you'll be able to succeed through in our school and beyond in life. I think this is no different than any other medical school. What you've got to bear in mind, everyone, is that the medical schools anywhere are regulated. These are state programs regulated by their medical regulator, whose primary job is to protect patients and protect service users. No different than the General Medical Council in the UK or the Hong Kong Medical Council in Hong Kong. The university will, they want you to pass. Let's be quite honest on this, but they're only going to pass you if you actually attend, study, and have the knowledge and skills to get through the exams to prove that you are a, a safe and effective practitioner at the level they expect you to be at year one, year two, year three, year four. Obviously, we're expecting more from a year six student than we are from a year two student, but that's no different than any medical school anywhere in the world. Someone said, can I sit the entrance exam for dentistry on one day and medicine for the next? No, it's the entrance exam is the same regardless of the program that you're taking. You can't take the exam, but the passing grades are a bit different. So sometimes students who well, might not quite get the passing grade for medicine might be able to be interviewed for dentistry if there are seats available. Uh, let's carry on. Uh, there's a fantastic question that I'm going to leave for the end. I love that question that's been asked about Charles University specifically. Uh, we've answered the one about people practicing in Hong Kong. In fact, we don't, it's not just Aaron. We have other students who are graduating who've come from Hong Kong. We've got students in the faculty from the ESF school network in Hong Kong. And we've also got another graduate who'll be coming out. Michael will be coming out next year as well. He, he started the year after Aaron. Someone's asked about scholarships. Now, I know there are some forms of scholarships for excellence. I think, Professor Brisbane, can you give us more information on that? But don't expect full fee scholarships like some U.S., universities provide? Um, that's right, Ben. We give on a merit base for all years, the top 10% of all students will get uh, a scholarship, depending on, on their grades, if you're in the top 10% of your, of your, your year group. Um, there are other scholarships or other funding opportunities available, um, most of which are government backed, it so depends upon where you come from, where various governments give their, their students up to 100% tuition fees like Israel, Germany, the Scandinavian states, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, America. We're in negotiation with some of the British protectorates as well. So Isle of Man uh, wants to give 100% for their students also. Uh, and we're happy to, to negotiate for you with Hong Kong government as well, if, if you're from Hong Kong or from the countries. Um, there are some hospitals, for instance, there are some hospital groups in Germany that fund their students uh, or fund students 100% uh, tuition fees. So when you pass our exam, if you have some German knowledge or you're a German citizen, uh, then you go into a separate um, competitive application for these scholarships. And they pay 100% tuition fees for all six years of your studies and give you a guaranteed job uh, upon graduation. And you can do the clinical rotations in their hospitals in, in Germany. So there's various schemes available uh, depending upon various different uh, options. Professor Bisman, I know you've mentioned this before because I know you're working with more hospitals. In fact, we've even got potentially some clinical placements that will start in the UK for those people that have the migration rights to come to the UK for that period of time. But someone's asked about exchange programmes in South Korea. Now, I know you haven't got South Korea, but we do have South Korean students in the faculty now. And if a student from South Korea perhaps wants to go and do some clinical attachments in South Korea, while you've not got the formal link, that's definitely something which you can support, even if it's within the student's time, the references, et cetera, correct? That's right. So, so we have, um, with the Erasmus program, which is the European government backed program, it doesn't stick just with Europe. There is possible to do Erasmus even outside Europe, which is a funded program. You do six months a year of your studies 
uh, elsewhere. There's IFMSA, International Federation of Medical Student Association, if I'm getting it right. That's the whole globe where you can do uh, electives across the globe. There are other countries which we have specific MOUs agreements with specific hospitals, universities, and with, this is a uh, it's a live program, so it's constantly changing with whom uh, you could do these with. I might actually hand this over to to Ms. Anikova because she's she's quite an expert on this as well uh, as the possibilities. But yes, if you want to do South Korea, I'm sure we can arrange in South Korea as well. We're uh, finishing in about ten minutes. So any last minute questions? And I do want to spend a little, little few minutes showing you how to apply. So if you've got any last minute questions, type them in now. We could, we haven't really going to have time for long questions. So if it's just a a quick question, type it in now. If it's a longer question, please please feel free to get in contact with me, Medical Doorway, at the end of this uh, at the end of this webinar. So Susanna, oh sorry to. No, no, I'm good. I also want to say that uh, me and Dr. Chuck, we are also trying to answer a lot of questions by typing. So if you haven't heard the answer to your question, it might be uh, tied back uh, to you directly. And while people are typing, I, I like to add a point as well, like uh, regarding the rotations in South Korea. Um, so if you're from US and you are you wanted to, or even from Hong Kong or anywhere you're from, right? Like if you wanted to do rotation abroad anytime in your clinical years, you can always arrange it. Uh, the only thing you have to do is to make sure the faculty knows about it so you can transfer the credit back to the faculty. And then after that, you just take the exam in the faculty and then you'll pass the exam. So essentially, even if there is no exchange program being arranged with your country or any medical schools, you can always arrange yourself and then you do it. And then after that, you can take the exam and that's all. And what happens as those things happen, then that starts to generate a formal relationship between the universities and more collaborations can then take place. You have to have some kind of embryo to start that process before more things happen. And that's what's happened in places like Israel and the UK. You know, students started doing summer placements or other placements or going to work. And that generated those links that we've now got in the UK and Germany and Israel, especially. Yeah. In fact, in the UK, uh, I was recently approached by UCA about a month or so ago they want our students to be doing years four five six in ucl in london and then to get uh, jobs directly in london in the ucl of all free hospital network uh, upon graduation i think i just want to sorry uh, i think it's very important what uh, uh, dr shook said uh, one of the point which is that the exams must be done by our staff we are accountable for the quality of your degree and that's why you can't have our exams done by any other staff anywhere else in the globe um, we are the quality assurance to make sure you have our standard, our high standard of, of knowledge. Okay. A few people have asked about the passing mark for the exam. Uh, you need to get around about 66% on medicine to progress to the interview and about 50% for dentistry to progress to the interview. The exam itself is not used to determine if you're admitted. It's to get you to the interview. The interview happens online about a week, sometimes two weeks after your exam date. It's an MMI style interview. Before you have your MMI interview, if you apply with Medical Doorway, we do a webinar to help you prepare for that, just to not tell you basically the how to answer it, but to tell you what kind of interview style you're going to kind of face because it's new for some people. Okay, uh, so it's about 60% for dentistry and 66 for medicine. 60%, sorry, yeah. I meant to say 60%, yeah. Someone said they'll contact Medical Doorway. You can go onto our website, medicaldoorway.com. You'll find our details there, and then we'll be definitely able to get in contact with you. And I'm going to divert people to the website in a moment once we've dealt with a few more of the questions. Someone's asked it, and I'm going to like this one before we deal with some of the other questions. What makes First Faculty of Medicine Charles? This is an amazing question. What makes First Faculty of Medicine of Charles stand out from other medical schools around the world? Now we've got three fantastic, I'm not even gonna say anything now for this one, because I think there are three people who are much better equipped to answer this question. So I'm gonna let you take it as a round robin, go for it. Uh, Dr. Chuck, why don't you begin as our most recent graduate? Well, as I said earlier, right, um, the preclinical medicine of uh, Charles University is extremely strong. It prepared me uh, thoroughly for my step one exam, which is like a preclinical exam. And um, because of that, that builds the strong base for me to sit the step two CK as well. And that basically just creates like a like a ripple effect um, just down the line. So that to me, as a student from Charles University, that is to me like something that is special. Uh, 
But I'm pretty sure, like, it, you know, for Dr. Brisman, he, he might have something else to say. Uh, I, I always have lots to say. Probably people would say far too much to say. Uh, I'll pass it over to Mr. Nicola before then I, I maybe round it off. Yeah, uh, thank you. I will just briefly say that for me, it's the recognition of the degree abroad that you're going to get that makes it stand out compared to other faculties of Charles University. And I would also say the community. And I mean, not only the student community, but also the teacher community and the high level of staff teachers that you will be, that will be teaching you during your studies and that you come in contact with. Beautiful. I'll, 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 sorry, I'll, I'll round it off just by saying one thing actually as well. Uh, I've attended the university many times for meetings. I've been in the university for enrollments. I was there when Aaron, I was at Aaron's enrollment. I was at his entrance exam. I was at his graduation. To see, and that's not, I'm not the only one, to see the students go through that full process and come out six years later, a bit older, a few more wrinkles, a few scars, but as with their, their, their title at the front of their name changing is a rewarding experience. And to see the careers that many of our graduates have gone on to have is something spectacular. And not just Charles University, the Czech medical schools as well have a reputation globally. The surgeon who led the USA's first full face transplant is a Czech surgeon who graduated from the Czech Republic and work, still works in Boston, Massachusetts, where Aaron's going to be going shortly. So the level of knowledge and the skills you will get from the Czech Republic and especially from Charles University is second to none. It really is. And we have, as I said, 1,200 graduates over, and over 2,000 graduates from Czech and Slovak medical programs working in the UK right now. Those numbers tell you all you need to know about the quality and what makes Charles University and the medical programs in the country uh, uh, stand out. And for the person who's asked about the Cambridge AIC diploma, yes, because this is the international Cambridge diploma that is accepted because it effectively is equivalent to three A-levels. Uh, I could just give uh, a little right. answer. Go and begin. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll just... Uh, Ending the round robin on that, that question about why our faculty, or why, why Charles University. Um, I think you've all put in very brilliant examples. There is, there is uh, almost infinite numbers. Just to, to broadly speak, um, I remember in my first year here, I was studying histology being taught by Professor Lloyder, who was a three times Nobel Prize nominee. You will work in the clinics of the Corrie from the, who got Nobel Prize for the Corrie cycle. You will walk past on a daily basis almost Albert Einstein's office, Mr. Here. You'll work in the Institute of Physiology in the Pukinji Institute, check Pukinia, uh, Pukinji fibers of the heart, Pukinji cells of the brain. There are all these one, this amazing history of education, of the highest level of education that you'll be partaking in uh, when you live here. But you also have that student life experience, which is second to none. There's no city that can compare to what the life you'll have here. Um, it's not to do with the fact that beer is cheaper than water. That's just aids for the student life to be lots of fun. But uh, people are so open minded. They're so easygoing. They're so they're kind and generous. Um, and you're in the very center of Europe. You can do every sport you can imagine. You can travel so quickly and easily to everywhere in the globe that there is there is. That's why I'm back here now. You know, I was a, a senior lecturer at UC. Uh, consultant surgeon at the Royal Free at the top of London. That's why I came back to Prague uh, a few years ago. There's no city that compares to it. So if you've got that short period of time of your life, that six years, which may seem like a long time, but believe me, once once you've spent the years after, it's a very short period of time. Why spend it at home? Why not get that life experience that you can't replace or replicate anywhere else? And Prague is there's no better place to do that than Prague and, and at this prestigious historic uh, university. Also, okay. the Aaron, sorry. Oh, like one more thing. Um, uh, I remember uh, I was asking the dean's office about it um earlier when I was sitting my step one exam. Uh, the average score of our step one exam, uh, of all who sat in in our first faculty of medicine, is actually around two forty. So at that time, it's actually the average of Harvard University. Like it is comparable to Harvard University. So like that, that's just like something that is popped up in my head, like just just now. So, Okay, we've answered actually over 63 questions. That's a lot of questions. There's two more questions that have been asked there, and they're related to the UK. So what I'm going to ask the people who've asked those two questions about clinical years in dentistry and UCL, just drop me an email with those because we are going to have to sign off in a moment. 
What I'm going to do for everyone who's online and for those watching the recording is I'm just going to go through how to make the application on the Medical Doorway portal because it is extremely simple to do that. Okay. So without any further ado, if you just let me share my screen. So everyone should have now the Medical Doorway website in front of them there. There are different ways to make the application. If you want to find out more information on the universities, you can click universities here and you'll find all the faculties listed. And Charles First Faculty is there. Or if you go on the drop down list, you'll see First Faculty is here. Now you can navigate to the application form very easily from any of the pages. And you click on the blue button that says check medical central application form. And these are all the regions that we run the exams. OK, the UK, the UAA exam was last weekend, so that's not open anymore. Whether you want to sit the exam in the Czech Republic, we can arrange that on June the 9th. If you are looking at sitting the exam in Hong Kong, you can click on the button here and you simply fill this form in and all the exam dates that we've talked about are here. What we'll need is passport details, the universities that you're applying to, whether you want to study medicine, dentistry, the forms are all here. Upload a copy of your passport and hit submit. That will come through to our team here. Once we've assessed the application, we'll then get in touch with you regarding the application and exam fees and then get your exam booked. Alternatively, you can study, uh, you can apply for the UK here as well. All the application forms are very, very similar, just the more options for you to apply for for different regions of taking the exams. If you don't want to go through that and you want to just get on with the application, very easy. Click apply now and choose Charles First Faculty. Okay, all the exam dates are also here. And if you click on, say, an exam for Hong Kong, it will tell you all the details about the exam. And then you can click on the form there and that will take you to the Hong Kong exam. So if you want to find out more details of the exams, all the exam dates are listed here with all the dates, et cetera. It is extremely simple and quick to make the application. And then we will be in touch regarding your personal statement and the other documents that we need so we can make sure that you get enrolled uh, on the exam and prepared so you hopefully then will be able to start your studies in September. What we will then do is if you've been accepted, you've got through the exam and got through the interview, we will then be getting on with your visa application. We've already started that for those students who got through the exams in the UAE. Uh, and they again, as I said, the visa deal is very much dependent on you and your individual circumstances. So we will actually deal with you as an individual. There's no simple rubric for everyone to follow on the visa. So I think if everyone's uh, we've dealt with all the questions, I want to say thank you to everyone who signed in. Uh, a few people have dropped out because it's got quite late now in uh, East Asia. I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Brisman, who I've spent a lot of time with both in the UK, Hong Kong and in the UAE recently, to Susanna from the faculty there and fantastic congratulations on arranging the open day over the weekend and the exam in Prague last Friday, because I know that was a very busy and stressful experience, but looking at the pictures and videos on Instagram, it was certainly a successful event. And last but no, by no means least, Dr. Aaron Chuk, who I met, as I said, seven years ago in London when we ran the exam there, was with him at the enrollment, with him at the graduation, all the stress of getting the visa and those kinds of things was all well placed because now he's about to go and start his career in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I'm hoping that many of the applicants that we've got now and people that were here today on the webinar will be working with you over the next few uh, weeks and months and then years to help you become the next generation of doctors and dentists. I did see that while the webinar was going on, we received another application for the Hong Kong exam. So we'll get in touch with you once after this webinar. And if you've got any questions at all, medicaldoorway.com, hello at medicaldoorway.com or fill in one of the inquiry forms. You could also book a Zoom consultation with Medical Doorway as well via our website. We do have availability. We've got some university visits we're going on over the next few weeks. We're off tomorrow to another university and then again a few weeks later. But we do have availability in our schedule for one to one Zoom calls uh, every Monday and Wednesday. And we'll perhaps put a few more dates because we're going to be here and there over the world for the next few weeks. But if you need anything at all, you can get in contact with us uh, or alternatively, you can get in contact with members of the faculty and they'll refer you back to us if the exams that we run is going to be the most suitable for you. So without any further ado, I'm going to say thank you so much again to everyone. Have a great evening or day, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you to the panelists that joined us today. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you soon and see many of you as students in Prague this coming September.